the Gospel of Matthew, with a word of wisdom from our Father in Jesus' name, verse 1. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judah and his brethren, the twelve patriarchs. And Judah begat Perez and Zerah of Tamar, and Perez begat Esram, and Esram begat Aram, and Aram begat Amenadab, and Amenadab begat Nason, and Nason begat Salmon, and Salmon begat Boaz of Rechab, Rechab from the book of Joshua, and Boaz begat Obed of Ruth, of the book of Ruth, obviously, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David the king. What we're reading here is Joseph's genealogy. And this has nothing to do with Christ's bloodline. God was the father of Christ, as I'm sure you already know. And when you go to Luke chapter 3, you'll find Mary's genealogy, which is Christ's bloodline. And when you go to where we left off, that would be 331 of the book of Luke, the gospel of Luke. And the difference being, it splits off into Nathan rather than Solomon, as far as the difference between Mary's genealogy, that is to say the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ, and Joseph, who was in modern terms his stepfather. But it's by adoption that this is significant, because as a Christian you are adopted into God's family when you become a Christian, and all are one in Christ Jesus, as Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 3. So that's the significance, and I think that's why you have Joseph's genealogy here, because it's a matter of adoption. And we'll continue on with verse 16 rather than go through the remainder of Joseph's genealogy because, as I said, you'll find Mary's genealogy, which is actually Christ's bloodline in Luke chapter 3, beginning with verse 23, where it says, As was supposed, in modern terminology, that would be the in-laws of Joseph, the father of Mary, Heli, being his father-in-law. And Mary didn't just come from Judah, but also Levi her father from Judah, as is documented in Luke chapter 3, and her mother from Levi. And as you know, Christ is king of kings and lord of lords, a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And you'll have documentation in the first three chapters of the Gospel of Luke that Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, was Mary's cousin, who was married to a Levitical priest. So there's your documentation that that is indeed the case. So picking it up, at verse 16 of Matthew chapter 1, And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ, born of Mary, not from Mary and Joseph. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, and from David until the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations, and from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. Now the birth of Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, engaged to be Mary, that is to say, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately, secretly. He didn't want to make a public spectacle out of it because he didn't understand what had happened. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord, that's the presence of God himself, appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Which is what Jesus means, Yahshua in the Hebrew, which means Yahweh's salvation, Yahweh's Savior, the office of Savior. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord, by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us, which is who Christ was. Because in Genesis chapter 1, when God said, Let us make man in our image, he was including himself. Because in the first world age, Satan rebelled, a third of God's children were deceived into following Satan, and rather than killing a third of his children, God decided to create this world age, being born of woman himself even, and paying the price for one and all time so that whosoever will should not perish in the lake of fire at the end of the millennium, but have everlasting life through the Lord Jesus Christ, which is why he came. He loved his children to that extreme that he would do that for you if you accept it. 
Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, which means house of bread, of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him. Verse 3, When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. He demanded of them, Herod demanded of the chief priests and scribes, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem, which means house of bread, of Judea. For thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art thou not the least among the princes of Judah? For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. And you'll find this written in the book of Micah, in the twelve minor prophets, in chapter 5, verse 2. Then Herod, when he had privily, privately, secretly, called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. Remember that star written of in the book of Numbers, chapter 24. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child, and when ye have found him, bring me word again, that I may come and worship him also. Which was not Herod's intention, as you'll find out in a moment. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star, which they saw in the east, went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy, and when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. They presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Now, he was born in a manger, as you know, so why does it say when they were come into the house? Because it was Bethlehem, the house of bread, Christ being that bread of life that came down from heaven. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt. And be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt. And it was there until the death of Herod that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. And you'll find that written in Hosea, which means salvation in the Hebrew, chapter 11, verse 1, also in the 12 minor prophets. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth, and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem, and in all the coasts thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy, Jeremiah, the prophet, saying, In Ramah was there a voice heard, lamentation and weeping, and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and would not be comforted because they are not. And this is in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 15. And Rachel died giving birth to Benjamin in Bethlehem, Benjamin being the last of the twelve patriarchs, that is to say the twelve tribes of Israel, Jacob. And when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeareth in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead which sought the young child's life. And he arose and took the young child and his mother and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea in the room of his father Herod, in the stead of his father Herod, that is to say, same bloodline of these Herods continuing, he was afraid to go thither, notwithstanding being warned of God in a dream, He turned aside into the parts of Galilee, and this is all meant to be, obviously. He came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. Now here God is teaching us that Samson, in the book of Judges, chapter 13, that prophecy was concerning Christ, inasmuch as Samson was a type of Christ, a type of Savior, that is to say, and that looked forward even unto Christ's first advent, that he would be a Nazarite. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye 
the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John, the cousin of Christ, as we know from the Gospel of Luke, had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. And he came in the spirit and power of Elijah, as we also know from the Gospel of Luke. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. And what does he mean? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. The king of Israel, the king of kings and lord of lords, was at hand. Christ was upon earth and about to begin his ministry after being baptized by John, who would prepare the way of the Lord and make his path straight. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees, we know who they are, come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? So now you definitely know who they are. If there was any doubt in your mind, you can go to the 23rd chapter of this Gospel of Matthew and document there for yourself that these Pharisees were the bloodline of Cain, the sons of Cain, the Kenites, the generation of vipers. Christ makes it so that there's no way around it. It couldn't mean anything other than that if the blood of righteous Abel fell upon that generation, generation meaning offspring, the serpent seed, the generation of vipers, the literal children of the devil, the Kenites, who bring about the negative part of God's plan, and you'll see them in this Gospel of Matthew, as well as the other Gospels, bring about the crucifixion of Christ, the negative part of God's plan, which brings about an extremely positive result, and it was because of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection that whosoever will can inherit eternal salvation through Christ Jesus, the living Word, the Word made flesh. So again, verse 7, again, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees, these are atheists, those who don't believe in life after death, the Sadducees, come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits, meet for repentance, and think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham, because Abraham's seed was Christ. It is Christ Jesus. That's what Abraham's seed was and is. That's the promised seed. And if you're not a Christian, you're not Abraham's seed and not heirs according to the promise. As you know from Galatians chapter 3, and it's because of Christ's first advent that salvation was opened up to whosoever will. So regardless of your ethnicity, if you're in Christ Jesus, then we are all one in Christ Jesus, and Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. But regardless of your ethnicity on the other side of the coin, if you're not a Christian, well, then you're part of Satan's tree, his family tree, that is to say, adopted into that. And you don't want that. That tree is going to be burned in the lake of fire. And to be grafted onto Satan's tree is not a good thing. He's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The Lord Jesus Christ is the tree of life. And once a Christian begins worshiping Satan at the sixth trumpet, when he appears in Jerusalem to his own children, the Kenites, at the sixth seal, the sixth trumpet, and the sixth vial, then those who were Christian begin to worship Satan and are no longer Christians. In other words, they're chopped off of the tree of life and grafted on to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the bad tree, the tree that's going to be burned. In other words, they're going to hell if they don't get their act together during the millennium, during the thousand years, because it's at the end of that thousand years that the judgment books are open. It's called the Great White Throne Judgment. Whosoever's name is not written in the book of life is cast into the lake of fire and blotted out of existence. But it's not God's will that any should perish, but all come to repentance, which is why he took it upon himself to be born of a virgin, Emmanuel, God with us, to bring about salvation to his children, whosoever will. But God wants to save as many as he can, because originally, everybody got along and loved God, but then Satan rebelled, and a third followed him in the first world age. You need to know that there are three world ages, or you're not going to understand God's word. Verse 11, John continues to say to the Pharisees and Sadducees, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner. And we'll go over the parable of the wheat and the tares, the parable of the tares of the field. It's called in Matthew chapter 13 to go into more detail on this. 
but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire, that lake of fire. So why is he telling the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the Kenites, this? Because they can receive salvation as well, just as easily as anybody else. All they have to do is believe upon him who God sent, that is to say, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then they're no longer a child of the devil, but a child of the living God. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? John knew who he was. John was born with the Holy Spirit, even in his mother's womb. He had the Holy Spirit within him. And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. And so then, should you be baptized as a Christian? Well, here, Christ, our example, is being baptized, so yes. But if one were to die before they had the opportunity, that is to say, at the last minute, they call it a deathbed repentance, and the thief on the cross that we'll read of before we get through with this Gospel of Matthew, he didn't get baptized. He just simply believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And what did Christ say? Today I will see you in paradise. Because he believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all it takes. But should you be baptized? Yes. It's symbolic and a public statement that you believe that Christ went into the tomb and was resurrected. That's what it symbolizes, you going down into the water and coming out. As a Christian, you believe upon Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, symbolic of his resurrection, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And right there you have the full Godhead, the Father speaking from heaven, the Son coming up out of the water, and the Holy Spirit lighting upon him like a dove. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Verse 2, And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, that's probation in biblical numerics, he was afterward unhungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And this is from Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. Christ is the living word, and he was very familiar with the scriptures, as familiar as you can be. If you get into your Father's word and study to show thyself approved, You won't have a problem with someone using one verse out of context to try and trip you up. Then the devil taketh him into the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple. This is where Satan will appear as the false Christ in Jerusalem at the sixth seal, the sixth trumpet, and the sixth vial. And saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, there it is again, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands shall they bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Most Christians, unfortunately, would not see a problem with what he supposedly quoted here, but you'll notice, and if you're a student of our Father's Word, you already know that he's quoting Psalm 91, and he's twisting it. He's changing the scripture to make it appear to say something that it doesn't. Because in Psalm 91, verse 11, it reads, For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. It didn't say lest at any time. You can't jump off of a building and expect the angels to save you. That's going out of the boundaries of the way, the path. So there you have it. He's trying to trip him up. Is Christ going to fall for it? Of course not. He's doing this as an example to us. He's teaching. He's the ultimate teacher, the teacher of teachers, Christ Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to what he says. Verse 7, Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. It wasn't within the parameters of his mission or yours to jump off the pinnacle of the temple. Again, the devil taketh him up to an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them. This is looking forward even to that time frame I mentioned a moment ago, when Satan appears as the false Christ. When he appears as the false Christ, he heals the deadly wound to the one world system, and then all the world wandered after the beast. They'll think that Jesus has returned, because of their biblical illiteracy. Verse 9, And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And that's what will happen when Satan appears as the false Christ. The whole world will wander after him, worshiping him, 
thinking that he's Jesus, and that is the mark of the beast, which is the deception. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the sea coast in the borders of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people which sat in darkness saw great light, the true light. Christ is that light, the truth, the Son of God, Emmanuel God with us. And to them which sat in the region in shadow of death, light is sprung up. The truth destroys the darkness. The truth destroys the confusion. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Christ being the King of kings and Lord of lords, the King in his dominion being the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men, pulling people out of the confusion of the world, out of the darkness, and into the light, into the many-membered body. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. They had no choice. And going on from thence, he saw other two brethren, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, in a ship with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. And he called them, and they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. They didn't have to think about it. They just did it. It was their destiny. And God's elect have a destiny to be delivered up, at which time the Holy Spirit will speak through them. And these four that we've mentioned so far in the book of Acts, you'll have a perfect example of that when the Holy Spirit speaks through them in Acts chapter 2. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments, and those those that were possessed with devils, and those which were lunatic, and those that had the palsy, and he healed them. And there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee, and from Decapolis, and from Jerusalem, and from Judea, and from beyond Jordan. And there you have it, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4.